Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. During the era in which Epictetus was first studying and then applying and then finally teaching Stoic philosophy, one of the great rival schools was that of the Epicureans, and both Stoicism and Epicureanism were in fact philosophical schools, but they also found ways to sort of leach themselves into the broader culture, so quite a few people who were not philosophers would identify with one or another of these schools. And the Epicureans were viewed in many respects as being at the opposite end of the spectrum from the Stoics. They actually did have quite a few things in common in that from the skeptic perspective they were both considered to be dogmatic philosophies. Um, they were both materialistic philosophies in that they, they don't think that there is any sort of irreducible soul that's not uh, material. Um, they think that the, you know, the divine is in some way material. Um, but where they really differed was about their vision of the whole point of human existence, the nature of the good. And so the Stoics had said that the good ultimately can be understood in terms of virtue, moral virtue, or in terms of the ruling faculty of the person. These, these really go together. And the Epicureans, uh, like I have here on the board, held that the good was ultimately pleasure, and that means the bad was ultimately pain. So what, what conduced to or produced pleasure was thereby good, and what led to pain was thereby bad. And if you had a mixture of pain and pleasure, that's you know perhaps neutral or perhaps a little bit worse or a little bit better, depending on how much you've got mixed together. They also did distinguish between different kinds of pleasures, but you can see core concept videos specifically on, on Epicurus about that, so I'm not going to go into that. Now, so the Epicureans are one of the major non-Socratic schools. All the other rival schools of the Stoics, um, yeah, without exception, are really uh, offshoots of schools or persons that had studied with Socrates. Um, Epicurus is a different sort of um, tradition, and the Epicureans tended to oppose themselves to pretty much everybody else. Like I put their pleasure is the good, pain is the bad. They were hedonists. Now, Epictetus criticizes them at a number of different points within his discourses about a number of different topics. They are probably his most common um, target of criticism, uh, with the, the academic skeptics coming in second. And he's got a number of different complaints to make against them. Some of them are really on target, some of them perhaps not quite so much. So here's one of them. He says that Epicureans fundamentally misunderstand pleasures of the soul or, or the mind. The Epicureans had said that mental pleasures or pleasures of the soul were in fact better than purely physical or bodily pleasures, pleasures of the flesh. So, you know, the pleasure of, of reading a book is in some ways better than the pleasure of uh, going out and having a night and, um, you know, getting really drunk and then having sex. Um, Likewise, they, they also thought that uh, some, some pleasures are produced by the absence of pains. Again, you can see a core concept video about that. Um, but the Stoics thought, at least Epic, Epictetus thought, that the Epicureans didn't really understand the relationship between pleasure and the good. For the Epicureans, they're saying pleasure is the good. So anything that's good 
is good insofar as it either is pleasure or is pleasant or in, is some way able to lead to pleasure. In that, in that case, it's what we call the useful or the you know, bona mutile in, in Latin. Uh, it's liable to lead to some, some results that we want. And the Stoics said, no, that doesn't really encompass the whole scope of the good. In this, they're actually uh, in line with the Aristotelians and, and, and the Platonists as well. Epictetus will talk about pleasure being generated by the existing good. And he talks about this as he is discussing this with um, an official who happens to be an Epicurean. He says, um, here we go. The goods of the soul, first of all, belong to the sphere of the moral purpose, or do they not? So they do belong to that. So is the pleasure of the soul something that belongs in that sphere? And then what produces that? Do we just have pleasure, you know, because it produces itself? And he said, that doesn't really make sense. What is it produced at? We must assume that there is already in, in existence a certain antecedent essence, an usia, of the good. And that is what we're responding to when we feel pleasure. So when we are, for example, cultivating virtue or conscious of our own freedom as we make a choice that is putting us on the right track or contemplating the progress that we've made, we're not, those things are not good because we're feeling pleasure in looking at them. Rather, we're feeling pleasure because those things are good. So there's a fundamental reversal that the Stoics think is happening, at least with respect to the pleasures of the mind. They might say a similar thing about pleasures of the body, but Epictetus doesn't actually say that per se. Um, now, what he does end up saying, though, is that the Epicureans aren't really about pleasures of the mind at all. What they really are about is physical pleasure. They just happen to think that the pleasures of the mind are things that are derived in some way from pleasures of the body. And, you know, this does make sense if we unpack what he's saying, because Epictetus or Epicurus would talk, for example, about, you know, being able to remember something and take pleasure in the memory. But um, this is perhaps an, an off-base criticism of the Epicureans, an unfair criticism that doesn't really take into account their, their well-worked-out doctrines about the distinction between mental and physical pleasures. But in any case, that is one of the things that Epictetus thinks. He thinks Epicureans, when you get down to it, they're not really about mental pleasures, they're really about physical pleasures, and they just kind of candy coat it or put some window dressing to make you think that they're talking about something more elevated. This is a common criticism of, of uh, Epicureanism. Now, he also um, says something really interesting in uh, chapter 20 of book two. He says that they received measures and standards from nature. Uh, this is what Epicurus himself did. Uh, he says, a man has received from nature measures and standards for discovering the truth. So, you know, by looking at what we do take pleasure in and what we do take pain from, we are learning something about the way human beings work and the way that we relate to reality. So he says, but then this person doesn't go on and take the pains to add to these and to work out additional principles to supply the deficiencies. Instead, he does exactly the opposite, endeavoring to take away and destroy whatever faculty he does possess for discovering the truth. And he uses examples there for, of uh, piety and sanctity. So, you know, the, the Stoics thought that we human beings can reason out the existence of gods who actually do care about human beings. The Epicureans thought there were gods, but they don't care anything about human beings because otherwise they wouldn't have a pleasant life, right? Uh, having a pleasant life means not being tied up with our nonsense down here in the earth. And so Epictetus says to Epicurus, Oh, wow, nice doctrine, buddy. I mean, think of what you just did for all the young people. You just told them God doesn't care about what they do. You know, how's that going to work itself out? You're almost better off just saying there's no gods whatsoever. So he thinks that the Epicureans are learning from, uh, you know, sort of the same stock of general ideas and human nature that the Stoics are drawing upon, 
but they're not going far enough and they're trimming away some of the important other experientially based uh, principles or experientially grasped principles that the Stoics themselves are contributing. Uh, another thing that he really goes after them on has to do with, with family life and social life. The Epicureans were very different from the Stoics in that the Epicureans counsel withdrawing yourself as much as possible from political or social life. So, you know, not just not running for office, but don't belong to clubs or anything like that. Um, in part because that would make your life more tranquil. And they also thought if you can avoid getting married and having children, you should do so. Now, there's several things that Epictetus says about this in, by way of criticism. One is Epictetus thinks that there is, in fact, a natural affection that parents have for their children. Uh, it can, you know, be damaged, it can be effaced, but we do have a sort of inclination to take care of and to love our, our progeny. So he thinks that the Epicureans have gone wrong in not acknowledging that. He thinks we also have a sort of natural social instinct uh, to, to connect up with other human beings. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't be jerks to them, right, and get, become envious and rivalrous and all sorts of other things. But we also do have a natural tendency to want to live in society together and to try to get along. Uh, so he thinks that the Epicureans just don't recognize that, and, and they're going wrong in their philosophy by doing so. The other thing that he really says, that, he, that he, he stresses, is, well, what if they put those doctrines into practice universally? You wouldn't have any human society. Because there's really two main things, there's a lot of other things as well, but there's two main things that you need in order to have a perpetuation of the human race. People have to have kids, which means they have to have at least sexual relations. If they're not getting married, uh, just every society has some sort of regulation of sexual relations that, that we can call marriage. Um, if, they're, if they're not reproducing, no more humans after a while, right? And all bets are off. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we're not just about reproducing. We have a whole social world. We have culture. And... That is a product of societies. So we do have to have some people who are willing to step up and, say, take political office or um, carry out the uh, difficult work of legislation or enforcement of the laws. So he goes on and he says, um, here we go. Um, He goes. He, he says, "What would a what would a, a, a Epicurean state be like? How would we, in fact, live out this this sort of life?" Um, I don't know the exact passage in, in front of us. Nobody would want to do anything. Everybody would withdraw as much as possible just to preserve their own pleasure uh, from all these things that are required for making human society function and continue. So these are some pretty serious uh, complaints. There's one other one that he, he puts in there, along with these uh, ones about pleasure, which is that the Epicureans essentially instrumentalize all the goods that are out there. And um, that is not only a, an error in the sense of getting things wrong about you know, why justice matters, but it should also tell us you don't want to walk down a dark alley with an Epicurean. The Epicureans would say, following Epicurus, the reason why you shouldn't commit injustice is because you can't be sure that you're not going to get punished. And Epictetus says, there's plenty of people who can be totally sure that they're not going to get punished. You know, they commit their crimes in ways that make it impossible for them to be detected. Or they use their influence or money or power or connections to not have to deal with any consequences. So if you're going to say that uh, it's mainly the punishment that we need to be concerned with and not not doing injustice because injustice is a bad thing. Hey, I don't want to have to you know, rely on you, buddy, because uh, you're one step away from being unjust. So these are a lot of, of uh, serious criticisms of the Epicurean position. Like I said, 
Uh, a few of them seem to be a bit off base, but many of them target some pretty uh, vital areas of the Epicurean doctrine. 